this morning I wanted you to think about osmosis. That process of how a solution that's on the outside of a cell gets inside a cell. It's how plants absorb water and nutrients in from the ground. And the effects of this can maybe more vividly be seen if you look at, you know, cut flowers and they're all those colors, but that's not their natural colors. It's because they've been, if you put the next one up, by osmosis, drew that color right in, colored the whole plant. You know, the scripture, the Bible talks about external things that have the ability to spread internally, affecting others, just like osmosis. And <clears throat> so I'd like us this morning to investigate three things. Scripture warns us about them. And there's instruction given for believers. The first, you, some of you probably have already guessed, is sin. Now, sin is uh, universal, but I want us to see how devastating it is, how it spreads as we look at a uh, description from the Apostle Paul. It's found in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as, though, through, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So it spread to all, no exceptions. But for us as believers in Christ, well, we've been washed, we've been set free from sin, and so for us, it takes an active response because our deliverance from sin, it, it doesn't make us incapable of sin, and it doesn't make us immune from the effects or the consequences of sin. Just because we've been delivered, we're not immune from it, and we're not incapable of it anymore. So I want us to, to look at some things that the apostles said, Jesus said, about what our response to sin should be. And the Apostle Paul writing to believers in Corinth, and it's in the context of them having to deal with sin, unrepentant, rebellious sin in the church. And in 1 Corinthians 6 through 8, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, Paul's referring back to the Old Testament memorial, uh, a week that they would celebrate um, I shouldn't say celebrate, that they would obey not eating unleavened bread for the whole week before Passover. Leaven is a type of sin. This put a little bit in bread and it goes through, it affects the whole loaf. That's what the point he was making, is that sin is what was really to be excluded. And in the Old Testament instruction for that feast, if someone was to be despising that instruction, rebelling against that instruction, they were to be cut off from the rest of the people. And the, in the context of Corinthians, that was the instruction Paul gave about the one that was in unrepentant, rebellious sin. So there needs to be this separation that from unrepentant, rebellious sin, there needs to be a separation. Now that's what Paul says. Well, what did Jesus say? Do you remember that some of the most explicitly graphic instruction Jesus gave was about sin? It's found in Matthew 5 and Mark 9. And Jesus was using figurative speech, but he said, if your hand 
or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. No matter how grievous this is, we need to get rid of things that cause us to sin rather than to be cast into hell. That's what Jesus said. Now, scholars have connected the dots for us a little bit to explaining that our hand represents things we do. Our feet represent places we go. Our eye represents things we look at, that we see. And as, if these things cause us to sin, where we go, what we do, what we see, then as painful and grievous as it is, we're to separate those things from us that we need to do it. Maybe this time of year, especially here in this valley where there's daily, there's smoke blowing up the river, and we're reminded of, of the necessity for fire breaks. And, you know, that's how you stop that fire from spreading and devastating everything. So when we look at this, we see that the apostles, Scripture, Jesus, are all emphatic that we need to separate ourselves from things that cause us to sin. Do you know there's also promises concerning this? I want us to look at what the Apostle Paul said. It's found in, in 2 Corinthians 6, um, starting at verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we recognize that there needs to be a separation from sin, or you might catch it by osmosis. It'll be in there before you even know it. Be deliberate about separating yourself from things that cause sin. Now, Jesus taught, another, <clears throat> taught his disciples another danger that could spread. It's found in Matthew 16, verses 11 through 12. How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus was teaching that this false doctrine can spread with devastating results just like sin. Do you know that much of the New Testament, much of the letters of the New Testament were written to expose and to confront false doctrine? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, wa I want you to be aware of this, this truth that Paul's letter to the Galatians was to confront legalism. Remember, legalism is Jesus plus, and in that scenario, it was the, works, the law of Moses. But the same formula, Jesus plus something else, is a false doctrine. It doesn't take Jesus plus something else for your salvation. Jesus has made atonement for our, our sins. Jesus, salvation's in Jesus' finished work alone. But look at Paul's response in Galatians 1.9 about if someone comes preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. If we were to compare things said in Romans, Peter, and Jude, they all confront a false doctrine called, if I can say it right, antinomanism. It's a big word, but it simply means that it's an erroneous conclusion about grace that it allows for presumptuous, willful, continuing in sin. 
That's what it means. And <clears throat> if we look at what Peter had to say about it in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, um, it says that those that do this actually are slaves to corruption, that they're in bondage. And then he goes on to say that it's, if you're caught up in this, entangled in this, it's worse than you were before you came to Christ. That's a staggering statement. But that's what he has to say about this false doctrine. And in Colossians and 1 John, well, they're, they're dealing with Gnosticism. And it's a Greek perspective that divides the spirit and the body, considering the spirit to be good and the body to be evil. And it resulted in all kinds of crazy applications. But I want us to note that in Colossians, Paul repetitively warned believers, don't let anyone cheat you of your reward. And if we were to look at what John said in 1 John 4, 3, he said that those that deny Christ came in the flesh, you know, they're making that division saying that he was only spirit. That's from the spirit of the Antichrist. So false doctrine is not a trivial matter. When we look at Scripture, when we look at the New Testament, this is not a trivial matter. And to help us glean a little bit of instruction, I, I want us to listen to Paul's instruction to two pastors, two young pastors that he was mentoring, Timothy and Titus. And he's instructing them about things so that they'll rightly respond to false doctrine. And, and so hopefully it will help us to turn here and, and look to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 19. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now that was instruction he gave to Peter, I mean to Timothy. Let's look at what instruction he gave to Titus holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. He's giving this instruction that this false doctrine's out there, and it's leading people astray. It's destroying homes that they need to know the truth. They need to study to know the truth. And I want us to look at this kind of a conclusion he gives to Timothy about this, because I think that it speaks to our day, what chapter 4, the first four verses says. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Wow. What an instruction. Preach, convince, rebuke, exhort, or encourage, because the time's coming when they won't endure the truth. Because of their itching ears, they'll turn to fables. So the bottom line to this is, know the truth. Know scriptural truth. There's no substitute for it. 
There's no substitute for it. Now, the, the relevance of the third danger that I want us to consider is stated in a very conclusive way by Charles Erdman, who was a professor of practical the theology at Princeton. And um, this book that I'd like to share from the preface of it was written in 1934. But this is what this, this professor has to say about the letter to the Hebrews. It says, the writer is not presenting a cold and formal discussion of religious dogma. He is writing with most practical intent. Every argument is the basis of an appeal. Again and again, he interrupts his logical discussion to apply to his readers the truth he has established. He rebukes, he encourages, he warns, he pleads. A fire is burning in his soul. He is presenting vital realities to men who are in peril. He goes on to say this about this letter <clears throat> and about the recipients of the letter. They were converts of long standing. Their faith had been inspired by men who were personally acquainted with the Lord. But since their conversion, much time had now elapsed. In earlier days, they had patiently endured pain and reproach. They had been exposed to the violence of the mob. They had suffered the loss of property. They had heard the jeers of malignant foes. They also had shown active sympathy for certain of their number who were imprisoned. Now their early enthusiasm had begun to fail. Their trusted leaders had fallen, possibly as martyrs. Their spiritual life was stagnant. They still believed in Christ as the Son of God and had no doubt as to the authority of Scripture. They were still within the church. They were holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. Still, they showed their love by ministering to the saints. Their prayers and cooperation were earnestly desired by the writer who believed in their ultimate salvation. But they were immature, were making no progress were neglecting their assemblies for worship, were feeling the sting of social ostracism, were threatened by the seductions of a false teaching, were losing heart, were weary of the conflict against sin, and so were in actual peril of apostasy, of losing their faith in God, of turning hopelessly from Christ. It is these characteristics of the readers which make the epistle of such practical value in modern times. No matter where these Christians lived, their counterpart can be found in every land and age. Their spiritual condition is now only too common. Even where the claims of Christ and the truths of Scripture are not denied, there is found among Christians too frequently disillusionment, indifference, drifting, languor, weariness, practical unbelief. That's what I wanted us to consider, practical unbelief, to where what you say you believe has no more effect on how you live. And I think that we all know the commonness of that in Christianity today, that people say they have faith, but it doesn't affect how they live. I want us to, from that very letter that that gentleman was expressing about, I want us to take note of the warning that came from this author to the recipients about unbelief. So let's look at chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? 
Now with whom he was angry forty years, was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Remember the, how the unbelief spread? Twelve spies went into the land, walked through it, surveyed it, came back with a report. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, it's a good land and we can take it. Ten of them said, it's a good land, but there's giants there, and, and, and we can't do this. And that unbelief <laughs> spread through the hole to where, indeed, they rebelled. They, they said, Lord, why have you brought us out here to die? They wanted, they wanted to get another leader and go back to Egypt because of unbelief, because of unbelief. Well, I want us to, to, to not forget that the resurrected Christ dealt with some believers about their unbelief. Remember on the day that Christ was resurrected and the women couldn't find his body and they came back and said he's, he's raised from the dead and... and and the rest of them didn't know what to make of that. And, and Luke 24 tells us about the two disciples that are on the way to Emmaus. And they, Jesus walks up beside them. They don't recognize him. And they're talking about all these things. And, and they say, well, haven't you heard? And they start to tell about all the events. And then in verse 25 of Luke 24, Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He confronted them about their lack of faith, about their unbelief. Have we forgotten how he responded to Thomas? Remember Thomas, the one that said, except I can put my hand. Well, let's just look at it. It's in John 20. When he had said this, excuse me, now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples went in, again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, and the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We see belief is a choice. Belief is a choice. Since belief is a choice, we can encourage one another in it. We can encourage one another in it. And, and I, I want that writer to the Hebrews, the one that was dealing with their unbelief, let's look at what he had to say to them in chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He's saying we can stir one another up. We can increase one another's faith. On Wednesdays, we've been having what we call Share Jesus, and the, the purpose of it's found in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul said, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. That's what we've been trying to do is is to encourage one another, build one another up in the faith. And people have been sharing things like scriptures, just read a scripture that the Lord's put on their heart, 
a song. People have shared songs, put YouTubes up and stuff to encourage one another. Testimonies of what God has done in their life. Sometimes we pray. And sometimes we share a word from Scripture. All for the purpose of encouraging, strengthening one another in the faith. And since in just a moment we're going to be remembering Jesus' sacrifice as we take communion together, and that's definitely a way to encourage one another in the faith. It's a way of reaffirming our belief in Christ. But before we do, I'd like you to listen to a little bit of a song. That It's an older song now, but I hope it will encourage you in your belief and what you believe. It's called Creed by Rich Mullins. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because if you believe it, it's having an effect on you. It's changing you. You're being, so as we prepare to take communion, I want you to consider these things as we ponder the fact that remember Jesus' suffering and his sacrifice. I hope that we'll remember that we need to separate ourselves from the things that cause us to sin. Things that have that potential, that we know have that potential. Will we separate ourselves from it? And there's false doctrines out there. You need to know what this book says. You need to know it. You need to know it. And unbelief is contagious. You can catch it just by osmosis. We need to make the effort to be built up personally and to build others up in the faith. It doesn't just happen. It takes effort. So, Father, again, we thank you for your goodness to us. I ask, Lord, minister to each one that's here. Help them to remember all week long how much you love them. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you and keep you.